You're listening to the Cycling Podcast Femina in association with Rafa, the fastest clothing in the world tour, the home of cycling with character. Ride and watch with Rafa in 2019 as they partner EF Education First and Canyon Shram. Listening to the Cycling Podcast Femina, brought to you by Skoda. Dedicated to closing the gender gap in cycling, one race, one cyclist at a time. This is our time. Hello, my name is Richard Moore. I'm with Rose Manley. Hello, Richard. Sorry, Rose. <laughs> almost caught you out there. I know. I was just uh, enjoying. It's we're doing an evening podcast for once. I was enjoying a enjoying a little beer, a sip of beer, but mm. I missed time that slightly. And Orla Shinui. Hello. Yes. Welcome to the After Hours podcast. This is a bit worrying slash exciting. Yeah. We last convened we three uh, in Nîmes at the mm. during the Tour de France uh, a few days after La Course, and we spoke a lot about that race, and we had some interviews from there. And you'll hear that later in this podcast. But there's been a bit of racing since then. So we thought we'd um, gather again and, and, and introduce the episode and hear Orla's news roundup. What else have we got in this episode? We've got extracts from Taylor Wiles and uh, Lizzie Banks's Giro Rosa diaries. They were released for friends of the podcast. Well, it's one episode weaving their two diaries together. Really a great listen. Lizzie Banks, of course, won a stage of the Giro Rosa, so you can hear what that was like from the inside from her in that episode, which was released for friends of the podcast. But you'll hear an extract in in this episode. Um, we'll also hear, as I mentioned, a few interviews, and we'll hear from the Internationals who uh, completed their Tour de France as well in France. But Orla, have you got a news roundup for us, please? I do indeed. And this is going to be a freestyle jazz mashup. Is that right? Yes. <laughs> Some, some such. <laughs> um, yes, so we last chatted at the Women's Tour. So since then, we've had the Gia Rosa, we've had La Course and the Prudential Ride London Classic. So the Gia Rosa, first of all, won by Annemiek van Vluten for the second year in a row. She won by 3 minutes 45 over Anna van der, Bre- Anna van der Breggen. So I always stumble over that because I feel like I should be saying Anna van der Breggen. But anyway, you know who I mean. With uh, Van Vluten's teammate um, Amanda Spratt in third. Van Vluten had the leader's jersey from the end of stage five. So she wore it for five stages. She also took two stage wins. The summit finish on stage five and the upper uh, individual time trial. So quite a comprehensive win from her. But aside from Van Vluten, Mariana Voss had an outstanding race. She took four stages in all, including a remarkable victory on stage three that managed to pierce through even the Tour de France hype and had all the cycling world a flutter on Twitter, didn't it? Um, if you haven't seen yet Voss coming up from behind a rather unfortunate Lucy Kennedy of Mitchelton Scott in the final few metres, up a steep climb, Kennedy already had her arm in the air celebrating. Then go and Google it now. Pause us. We'll still be here when you get back. Do it. A- actually, even if you have already seen it, pause us anyway and go and watch it. Easy it's now, Orla. Yeah, do come back. Do have you come done back. it? It is amazing. Do the come back. But hang on. Yeah, this. it is. I'm not sure about, <laughs> not sure about that. <laughs> no, I'm wetting their appetites. Hang on. There you go, they're back. Told you it was worth it. Amazing. Um, anyway, stage wins as well for the Italian Letizia Bor- Borghese of... Aromatalia Viano, a first win of the season for them and a first professional win for the 20-year-old Italian. Lizzie Banks with a first pro win of her career as well, although arguably only her second biggest win. Can you tell me what the biggest win of her career has been? Pedalos de Charme at the Women's Tour. Très bien, exactly. Um, and a stage win as well for Anna van der Breche. Um, Cassia Nivia Doma had held the race lead from the opening team time trial, which is won by Canyon Tram, until stage five. And when Van Vluten took it and didn't let it go, Nivia Doma finishing in fifth in the end, which was her joint best finish um, of her career, matching her fifth place finish of 2015. On to La Course and Mariana Vos continued her superb form, took the win at the top of the final climb from Amanda Spratt, who had looked like she could maybe just hold on after going on a late solo attack. Leah Kirchman of Team Sunweb finished in second with Cecily Utrecht Ludwig in third for Bigla and Annemiek van Vluten, who has won this event for the last two years, settling for seventh after Spratt's failed attack. And then the Prudential Ride London Classic was won by Lorena Vibis of Park Hotel Valkyrie 
Hockenberg continuing a fantastic season and remarkably a first world women's world tour win for her. Elisa Balsamo of Valkar Silence was second with Cora Rivera of Sunweb in third. Now, the Prudential Ride London Classic was overshadowed quite dramatically by a crash in the finale. Kirsten Wild actually crossed the line first, but the defending champion was disqualified for cutting across and deviating from her sprint line. Her back wheel was clipped by Chloe Hosking, which led to an horrific looking crash. Eleanor Barker broke her collarbone in that crash. And Wild actually thought she'd won the race. She gave a winner's interview and everything before being told that she had to be stripped of her victory. And it was given to her compatriot instead. And that was a subject that sparked an awful lot of debate on Twitter, of course. I mean, it was quite a dramatic, when you see from the overhead shot in particular, it was quite a dramatic deviation. She'd swerved from the left over to the right and then it was a swerve back to the left again and um, that caused the crash so it, it you know it looked quite dare I say reckless we were just talking before we all pressed record I don't think any of these things are ever really maliciously intended but um it did look quite thoughtless I guess more than anything else I think also when you've got someone of Chloe Hoskins caliber going down then that's also a sign that it it was um out of character, um, you know, kind of out of character for a sprint like that. I mean, they're all kind of racing incidents, but I think we know that Chloe Hoskin would be able to, is able to read a race, is able to f- take the best lines, is able for most of the time to keep herself out of trouble. Um, so I think that is also, uh, not that it matters what the calibre of rider it is that goes down, but I think that is a, a good sign that Kirsten Field would have come off her line quite severely. Yeah, I think um, she did... Uh, you made the point as well, Rose, about Elia Viviani at the Giro being disqualified for moving from his line and not causing a crash. I'm not sure if that should come into the equation or not because you know riders can get lucky. On this occasion, it might have been bad luck that so many riders were stacked so closely behind and, and, and were caught up in it. And that's not that's not Kirsten Veal's fault. Um, it has to be judged on how... Mm radical dramatic the deviation is and and clearly in this case the judges felt it was it was dangerous but i don't think i don't think anybody's suggesting that kirsten field set out to um to cause harm or to be dangerous she was just looking for clear road and trying to win and and looking ahead of her yeah i think even if 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 the crash hadn't happened behind her though just to pick up on what you said richard i think it was a dangerous move regardless really and, and i think it would have merited disqualification regardless of whether or not anyone had come down behind her eleanor barker's comments were quite interesting she broke her collarbone and she she sort of you know came to veal's defense against a lot of criticism which you know that that reflected well on her i thought um you know, I think that it can be dangerous to judge it entirely from TV cameras and angles and so on. And it, only if you're in it do you know <clears throat> really what's gone on. So I would defer to the riders, I guess, and um, they they, they kind of know what's going on. I don't think Carson Field has a reputation as a dangerous sprinter. So yeah, an unfortunate incident. What do we think of the Ride London Classic? Because it's a criterion. Yeah, it is. I've never really been uh, a fan of it. And and it's one of those ways where you think that, you know, as London's my hometown, that I'd be really passionate for this race coming into the complete, you know, really into the centre of London. And obviously it's got a huge uh, event the following day and then the men's race. But to me, it's a crit. And I think they even shortened it this year. So it was only that each lap was like 3.2k. So, I mean, that's, that's really getting into... Yeah, it's, just, it's it's completely criterion territory, and it's one of those races where you don't feel like you need to watch the whole race to see what happens. I mean, you, you kind of you need just to see the last mm. kilometer most of the time to see what happened in it. I think they get a lot of positive PR for having the same prize money as the men, and that kind of shields them a little bit from criticism of the actual race. I think it gets a, a lot of positive PR outside of cycling for that, and and it gets a lot of people applauding it and saying how great it is that we have a, a women's race on as a, you know the same caliber as as a men's race. But in terms of the caliber of racing, I don't think it's ever one that that gets me excited. I find it curious that it is a women's world tour race. I mean, obviously, it's because it f- fulfills these set criteria. But I, I find it a sort of a necessary sprinters race. I think sprinters need their own races. They're never necessarily the most exciting to watch. Dramatic finishes, yes. But as you say, Rose, not one that you would sit glued to or feel like you need to be glued to in case you're going to miss any of the action. You can quite safely 
watch the last lap or so and, and catch the rest of it on highlights, I feel. Not to be too down on it, but yeah, it doesn't get my juices flowing. On the other side of the continent almost, um, in the most beautiful city in the world, was a new race happening on the same day. Um, San Sebastian, the first edition of the, the female race there, won by Lucy Kennedy. And that, that was good. That was on TV as well. And, you know, the coverage was good and it, it looked great. And it's a fantastic race. Amazing support in the Basque country for bike racing. And it looked like uh, the women, the first edition of the women's race was a great success. And um, I should just go back to the Ride London. We should remember also that it's not going to be a women's world tour race True. next year. It, it's That's actually going to be a calendar class than anything else, yeah, isn't it? But you know, it won't it won't have that uh, status. So we'll have to wait and see what kind of riders will turn up next year for that. But yeah, I mean, San Sebastian that was a fabulous race, and it's so nice for Lucy Kennedy also to get finally a victory when she was so horribly denied well not horribly denied she, so did, she did a lot of checking didn't she behind yeah. her for, <laughs> for celebrating yeah she had a good uh, 20 second or 23 second gap to Yannicka Ensing so I think she was safe but that is that to me is a, a fabulous um, addition to the women's calendar and you could tell by the strength of I mean, Mitchell and Scott they had Georgia Williams they had Annemiek van Fluten there they had Amanda Spratt they had Lucy Kennedy there um, so the fact that Mitchell and Scott had given it, well, and all the teams had given it so much respect by sending a really strong team to it, obviously shows that that is a race that the women's peloton wants to support. Any other races? You've got notes there, Rose. I, yeah, well, I know. I wondered why you kept on looking, looking down over my your shoulder and started talking about San Sebastian. No, I was, I, I, it was always on my, it was always <laughs> on my radar. That. Well, no, all I was going to mention was there, there were a couple. San Sebastian wasn't the only Basque races, we, and these aren't women's world tour races. These are um, point one or point two races. But I just wanted to point out about Ashley Mulman getting a uh, yeah, of course, win yeah. um, in the Basque Country at the oh my god, Nafara Naf. That's not the beer talking, that's just me. Nafaro Roca. Oh, that's terrible. Is this the beer you're drinking? Is that the name of it? Or is it- <laughs> but a uh, Basque um, classic race. She won. Ashley yeah. Mormon won. Um, which And Lucy Kennedy actually came second there because, I mean, she Lucy really rides very well in the Basque country and has already won. This is like the second... She had two wins in the Basque country this year, which is crazy. Um, but yeah, Ashley Mormon won. And that is the last time... The last time she won anything... Uh, outside of the South African champs was May 2018 and then the last time she won anything outside of the South African champs and the Morbihan races was May 2017 so I'm sure that will have given her a massive uh, boost especially as I don't know whether you guys saw the cycling news blog that she wrote about how her Giro Rosa performance was really affected by getting her period early and having stomach issues and um, it's a really interesting read. I recommend people go and um, read it, just partly to hear um, a woman speaking honestly and openly about how their period might affect their performances on the bike. Um, but she was talking all about her fighting spirit when she wrote that blog, which was a few days before she won this race. So I thought worth pointing out. Hats off to her. A community around the world. Stories and films with the most compelling characters. The world's finest apparel. Explore the world of cycling with Rafa. Thank you very much indeed to Rafa, our headline sponsor. Uh, Rafa, of course, I've been following EF Education First throughout the year with their films, EF Gone Racing. Um, you can watch them at rafa.cc or on the Rafa channel on YouTube. I recommend the recent one with Lachlan Morton. Very good indeed. And lots from the Tour de France as well, of course. We're convening, we're melting here in Nîmes and we're uh, speaking a few days after La Course by the Tour de France. Well, we all got together in uh, Po a few days ago, didn't we, for La Course. Orla, you had to skip off before the, the finish, but what were your thoughts on the race? Won by Marina Voss again, and well, it was a very exciting race, we both thought, didn't we, Rose? It was absolutely brilliant, and I was chuffed that it was so good, because I felt we were spoiled a little bit the last two years in particular, when we went up the Col des It was so... It felt quite epic, that, and Annemiek van Vluten's dominance on the top of that climb, notwithstanding, it was amazing. And last year, we had that thrilling sprint to the, to the finish, given that it was another summit finish. And I was a bit worried that this year just wouldn't hold up in comparison and oh my life it was just brilliant I mean we were all gathered in the Eurosport truck screaming at the television when Mariana Voss came up that final climb it was just beautiful the power that she showed I mean it was tragic as well for Amanda Spratt but 
I think we all pretty much expected that Spratt would be caught at one stage. You thought, OK, maybe if, the, if she could hold this to the line, it would be brilliant. Nothing against Amanda Spratt. I'm delighted for the finale that it was on the platform that it is that Mariana Voss not just won it, but the way that she won it and the delight that she showed crossing the line. And we've said this before, that someone who is often compared to Eddie Merckx, given the extent of her Palmaris, is still so desperate and hungry for a win. And the way she was punching the air huge smile on her face it meant so much to her and that is just brilliant for the race i loved it i also saw a little clip online of anton voss watching did you see that H- hank oh dad. sorry yeah hank her dad. Adon's her brother yeah, sorry, not anton her brother yeah. um uh, dad watching and he was just you could see he was absolutely thrilled and it's just amazing that as you said all that she can have so many wins and still be so her family can be still so thrilled for her and i think it just proves that she's back to her best i mean a few years ago, if you think about how much people wrote her off, she had Especially injuries. Richard, I seem to remember. Oh, <laughs> don't remember that. Please insert clip of Richard <laughs> I from don't the remember past. That. <laughs> I don't remember that. No, but it was a, it was a, it was a great race, and I think there was a lot of positivity in the paddock afterwards, wasn't there, among the riders who, you know, they had a good crowd, uh, great support, nice atmosphere, and a really great course, a really sporting testing but not too testing course we covered it in an episode of Kilometre Zero didn't we? will we hear some more reaction from after the race we both spoke to people Rose, well let's hear first from Lucinda Brand because we neglected to mention Leah Kurtzman who was second uh, on the day, very good performance from her and her team because Lucinda Brand was up there as well here's what she told Rose at the finish Lucinda, can you tell us how that uh, race worked out for you? Uh, yeah well, I didn't have the Giro legs, but uh, I think if I looked around, I was not the only one. It definitely was tough, especially, uh, was it the second last lap with the uh, pace of Van Meek? And then uh, we had this small break actually with all the strong riders, and out of this, I joined the break with Amanda. And when we almost were cut, catch back, she continued. But uh, yeah, we were with a lot of riders from our team in the group and we knew we had a good finish with Leah. Uh, even though we also knew, of course, that Marianne would be a big favorite on a finish like this. But, uh, I think we did a good and we can be satisfied with this. And did you think that group of five that you were with, with Cecily and with Soraya Paladin, did you think that might have a chance of sticking? Uh, if everybody really should go full, then it would be like 2% chance because like Bulls, Bulls was not in and I still had quite a lot of rides in the group to chase. So if you really all push it all in, maybe. So yeah, no, that would be uh, really difficult for sure. Yeah. That was Lucinda Brand of Sunweb. Sorry, or I don't think I got pronunciation quite right, did I? Well, it's Rob Hatch who keeps pronouncing it differently. I do actually just say Brand, but he always says Lucinda Brandt. Brandt. Okay, thanks for that. Um, we uh, also uh, you also Rose spoke to Lizzie Banks, our diarist, um, who is having a, a great season, isn't she? She rode a really good women's tour. She rode a fantastic Giro Rosa, and that team is impressive. The way they've been riding, they're sort of greater than the sum of their parts, aren't they? They 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 always seem to ride as a team, and obviously have a have a great leader in Cecilia Ludwig as well, who was third on the day. But here's what Lizzie Banks had to say at the finish. Delighted that you see that Cecily got third today. Yeah, I just found out. It's uh, it's awesome. You know, in some ways we had a fantastic Giro, and sometimes in some ways we had a slightly disappointing Giro. And so to come back and fight like we did today, I am so proud of the team. Like we're a small team, but we raced so flipping hard today. At least the Nicolet in the break. At least got the QOM jersey. Like we were fighting, fighting, fighting to stay in the front to help the leaders as much as we could. And uh, yeah, for Silly to top it off and take third in, in uh, such a strong field is cool. And you guys were always in the break. I mean, there was two of you in, in the early break and yeah. then Cecily got into that group. Silly, yeah. looked strong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, she did a perfect job being there because she could just sit there and try uh, not to go through and try to save as much energy as possible but if it stayed away then she was there and you know balls had to chase and uh, put us in a really good position and then we could warn her from behind what was happening and yeah it was perfect and how much did the pack think that Amanda Spratt was gonna stay away 
flipping heck. I mean, I was dropped on the, like, near the top of the first climb on the last lap. So that was when Spratty had gone. Uh, and so I could hear what was happening in the radio. And it's, I guess it's just, um, yeah, it's a, it's a game, it's a waiting game. And, and uh, who can be the most patient? And, uh, yeah, you have to play your cards sometimes. And, and you might wait and it can pay off. And sometimes it's not going to work, but sometimes it is. And you just have to, yeah, take your chances and see what happens sometimes. I'm hoping you're going to get a holiday now after all this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm going to have my first break since January. So I've been racing since February. So, yeah, maybe a two-day break in sunny Sheffield and then uh, back to it with hopefully preparation towards Worlds. So. And another interview from after the race, Ashley Milman Passio, the South African on CCC. Of course, her teammate, um, Marina Voss, won the race. And I mentioned Big Club riding very effectively as a team. And, and actually, it was a day when we saw a lot of it interesting and effective team tactics with Amanda Spratt going off the front uh, with you know Annemiek van Vluten lurking behind Bulls Dolman's also chased down a very dangerous five rider move at one point very effectively although they weren't there in the end and CCC uh, brought back Amanda Spratt for the finale to set up Voss so that was impressive too and here's what Ashley Moen Passe who had featured in that five rider break earlier on had to say at the finish Ashley um, team obviously had a lot of confidence in Marianne there did a lot of work to bring Amanda Spratt back but was there a moment where you thought maybe she she was away um, we were pretty confident um, that she would come back I mean she'd put in a big effort I was with her in the breakaway and I knew you know there was too many teams that weren't in it you know Sunweb had a lot of riders there Bulls and us so um, I think we played the game perfectly we kept things cool and calm and we knew what we were doing um, our director Hirun was also really good on the radio keeping us calm and as I said was very much tactically planned um, to keep her just in front until this very last little kick before the, ooh, the line um, because of course if we brought her back too quickly then there'd just be more uh, attacks so yeah it just worked out absolutely perfectly what's it like to ride for a, a leader who's in such incredible form and clearly so confident herself yeah, I mean, it's pretty incredible, you know, uh, with Mariana and finishes like this, uh, where it's technical and hard. Um, she must be the world's best finisher on, on this type of finish. So it's uh, really great to see how she, you know, she she puts her mind to it and she executes perfectly. There's a lot to learn from her. And, um, yeah, she's an incredible athlete. Seemed a well-balanced course. We saw a very open race and, you know, we saw Anna van der Breggen have a go, Annemiek van Vluten mark a couple of moves as well. But it wasn't a course that you know allowed one team or one rider to, to dominate. It seemed quite open. Were you a, were you a fan of it? Yeah, I think it was really a, a, a great race today. I think um, arguably the best the course um, thus far. Of course, you know I am a, a climber and our mountain top finishes are, are also pretty amazing. Um, but this kind of a course, I think, was a real show for the people. You know, as I said, they're all out on the course waiting all day for the men to come past and I think this just adds to their entertainment today they got a pretty good show from us this morning um, it was great for us because we had all the people out there really into it shouting so um, yeah it was a great day out there Shoot, uh, shoot at l'arrière du peloton cycling podcast team car at the back of the pack please well, that's the voice of Seb PK interrupting this month's episode of the cycling podcast Femina to remind me to tell you that sponsoring this month's episode is a new sponsor Heist Heist is on a mission to take away the frustration every woman has with their underwear. Excuse me, Richard? They've already revolutionised tights and shapewear and there is more coming in 2020. I don't have an awful lot to say about Heist products, uh, ladies, but but I think you do because we were talking about this before we started recording and, well, we're very grateful to Heist for supporting the Cycling Podcast Femina and I think they've sent you some products, Orla. They have. And yours yours are on the way, Rose. I mean, I'll confess, I've never heard of Heist before, but all my life, they are properly amazing. Richard, now you may or may not know this. I'm not Keep someone this to tight, judge. Orla. But oh. <laughs> tight. Can I just say to everyone that you stole that off Orla earlier? He stole, yeah, stole that, that joke, terrible but, pun yeah. off me. But tights, and me and Rose were talking about this before, are usually the most uncomfortable garments to wear. I genuinely hit them. I put off wearing them for as long as I possibly can in winter. I'd rather go with cold legs. They're just rotten. I mean, when you put them on, Richard, you may know this, they're they're like 
uncomfortable to begin with anyway and then within about half an hour they're sagging down around your knees and you're spending all day oh, poking them up they're, com- they're so inelegant they're so uncomfortable anyway heist redesigned decided to redesign tights for this very reason so they, they, they're designed to move with your body instead of against your body. They have a whole team of in-house innovators who actually are headed up by the woman who um, revolutionised swimsuits. Do you remember the fast skin swimsuits that came in in like uh, the millennium, which um, were brought in by Speedo? And they saw world records tumbling and people called for them to be banned because they were so revolutionary. Well, this woman, Fiona Fairhurst, came up with the fast skin swimsuit and she is now ha- heading up the lab at Heist. Um, for tights so they have completely rethought tights there's no seam to them there's no gusset which is a horrible word anyway never mind a horrible piece of garment and they're beautiful to wear they're genuinely lovely this i'm so excited about this all because mine haven't arrived yet but i'm very excited to receive mine because i'm exactly in the same boat as you i always find tights they normally i normally have to buy them a, a size too big so that I can lift them up so they don't in the day just <laughs> so you wear them with a belt <laughs> yeah so I you know lift them up braces I, I could just yeah wear them as like a kind of like a saucy jumpsuit in a way when I normally get them but I'd rather not I'd rather yeah rather like just a boob tube jumpsuit <laughs> yeah exactly but just all see-through rather nice but um I would rather have tights that just fit and are comfortable so I'm very heartened by the idea that those are out there and they are winging their way into my tooting flat as we speak. They are, they're genuinely like a second skin. They're amazing. And also, I just have to say that they sent me um, a bodysuit that's called an outer body bodysuit. And again, it's just like a second skin. It's beautiful to wear. Absolutely love it. I can't rem- recommend it enough. Now, I know that we do have male listeners, but I would recommend, right, for brilliant brownie points, buy your lady love a pair of these tights because guaranteed she'll open the box she'll be like what are you doing honey tights seriously romance killer until she puts them on and she will love you for finding a pair of tights that don't feel like tights right yeah well that sounds like a great suggestion thanks Orla and I look forward to your report (laughs) Rose Um, shop now at heiststudios.com that's h-e-i-s-t hyphen studios.com for 15% off use the code heist15 at the checkout H-E-I-S-T-15 at the checkout at heist-studios.com. I should say that it's case sensitive. So heist is all in capital letters and 15 is in, is in numerals. That's for the discount code, yes. Enjoy. How does the offer of free beer sound to you? Oh, it's good, Rose. <laughs> Sorry, I'm Excellent. Oh, it's not the best bottle go. opener. Anyway, that's what the sound of beer opening is like. Um, this month's episode is also sponsored by Beer 52. Our listeners are, are offered a free case of beer. Uh, all you have to do is pay £4.95 for the postage. So go to beer52.com forward slash femina. That's F-E-M-I-N-I-N. And you'll get a case of beer for just £4.95 to cover the postage. Rose, I mean, I'm you're sorry. struggling here a little bit, aren't you? <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm trying to stop this from foaming everywhere because I was... Um, yeah, was it bit... just opened, but... Um, oh, God. You've, you've already, you've already oh. polished off a, a bottle. That's your second bottle. Um, <laughs> As you can tell. <laughs> <laughs> I'm... Yeah, we, we've got the latest case of Beer 52 Beer. Each month they deliver a case with a different theme, uh, which generally are geographic. So Germany, Korea, Norway, South Africa, California and Finland have all featured in the cases. Uh, but as an independent UK company, Beer 52 are also passionate about the UK craft beer scene. So quite a few boxes have British beers in them. Now, what are we drinking tonight? This is international beer, Rose. I'm drinking mm. uh, a German beer from the Yankee and Kraut Brewery. Uh, it's called Transfusion. It's the only transfusion you can have in cycling. It is, yes, yeah, so a nice pale ale. <laughs> um, you've got, yeah, I've got, uh, I've, well, I just polished this one. I polished that off very quickly, that one. This is called Chatsy. This is from Budapest, Hungarian. Uh, a little nod beer. to the Giro next year, starting mm, in Budapest. Yeah, wouldn't mind. If I could just drink all of this, the whole Giro, then that would be... That would be excellent. And then I, now I'm just onto my second. I'm onto a Eden Pale. I don't think people should be encouraged just to. I think they should be savouring it more than perhaps we are. We but are savouring it. I, I've already had a this um, Bivog Tack Pale Ale. 
You know, tack is yes in Polish. So you said tack to that. Yeah, this is Austrian though. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but anyway, um, it's a very fancy design on the can of this one, isn't it? Look That's, at that. It's, it's a lovely, scary. very Austrian as well. It's kind of like, um, it looks like, and it's got a wheel on it. A wolf chasing a wheel. Mm. But it was very nice as well. Very fruity. And uh, they're all pale ales, actually, these. You're mm-hmm. more of a lager drinker, aren't you? I am a lager drinker, but this one was a... Was that a white this beer? This one's a white, the Schatzi was a white uh, beer with a little dog on the front. That was amazing, actually. Well, if you fancy a crate of uh, different eight different beers, uh, all very interesting with their own stories behind them, which you can read about in the, the, the magazine that you get with the, the Case Ferment magazine, you also get a snack in there. Go to beer52.com forward slash Femina. That's F-E-M-I-N-I-N. That's beer52, the numbers 52.com forward slash Femina to get your case of beer for just £4.95 to cover the postage. Well, we heard some reaction from La Course in the last part and inevitably, every year when La Course is held, there was a lot of debate and discussion about the lack of a women's Tour de France, whether there should be one and whether the tour organisers ASO have any plans to put on an equivalent event for women. Well, this year, on the day of La Course, there was actually some news on this front. A story appeared by the Reuters journalist Julien Preto about ASO's apparent plans to organise a women's stage race. One morning at the Tour de France, Richard spoke to Julien about his story and asked whether he had any more details. Put some flesh on the bones. Tell me about what you understand is, is ASO are planning. Well, the first plan is they're, uh, they're setting up uh, like a cell to develop women's cycling within ASO. Uh, they should be operational uh, like somewhere around September. And their idea, the big idea, is to create a race that would be to women cycling what the Tour de France is to men cycling, like the major event. Do you have an idea when, I mean, what time scale would be in terms of when it would be held and, and, and when it might be launched? Well, they don't have details yet on when. Um, in terms of calendar, what is sure is it's not going to be um, at the same time as the men's Tour de France, that's for sure, because it's a logistical nightmare. Uh, what was possible in the 80s is not possible anymore because of uh, you know the tour has grown so big, uh, with like 29,000 police officers every day, you know, working on it. The organizers don't have the resources, and the government, the state, wouldn't have the resources to you know secure such an event. Do you think it would be called the Tour de France? I don't know. I don't know. It's interesting though because I, when I spoke to ASO earlier this year, they said they didn't have anybody employed to look at women's racing as a whole. Um, so this is obviously a new development. It is. It is. I think every everyone's you know look on the women's sports in general has dramatically changed. Uh, so I think everyone, starting from FIFA for football to ASO now with cycling, you know, they, they kind of have to. They have to to go into it and. I mean, we all know ASO, you know, it's very often, you know, about money and there's a lot of money to be made. So I think it's a clear, I mean, for them, it's a, it's an easy decision to get into this. One person who I saw at La Course uh, was Jerry Ryan, who is the owner and benefactor of the Mitchelton Scott team. And that's one of the few teams that has always had a men's and women's team with exactly the same um, you know, sort of names, sponsors, uh, they don't share support staff, but uh, there seems to be a lot of integration between those two teams, and always has been. It's the team of Annemiek van Vluten, of course. So I grabbed a, a word with Jerry Ryan, who I'd say is also the, the sponsor of the team, as well as the owner, at the finish. It looked like it was almost going to be two wins in 24 hours for you there. Uh, it was. Uh, you know, Pretty gave it the best. That was uh, the plan to, for her to try and get a win today, and uh, not always the plans work out, but uh, gee, what a, what a fantastic uh, ride by her and gutsy, and uh, you know, they just caught her in the end, as they do. Um, so, you know, I think all the girls could uh, hold their heads up uh, very high to be proud of uh, the team and uh, what they nearly pulled off. I know you brought some of your best wine to celebrate last night. Did you left some of it over for tonight in case of a win here? Uh, I did, uh, in fact, it, uh, but unfortunately... All the girls are heading out uh, to Japan and other places, uh, so I've said I've got to send it to them. Uh, unfortunately, I won't be uh, 
with him to drink it, but uh, uh, another race and uh, another victory. I want to ask just about how the women's team is integrated into the men's team. Seeing you here today, um, there's obviously, uh, you know, it's more than just an add-on, isn't it? It seems to be a real part of the, the whole team. Well, it's never been an add-on, you know, from day one. Uh, when uh, I spoke to Shane about setting up the men's, I said, I want a women's team as well. And, uh, you know, what, what the same equipment, the same... Uh, facilities uh, and uh, also the same assistance from coaching down to doctors to uh, physios. And so when you have the world's number one rider, Annemiek van Vluten, you know, winning the, the Giro Rosa, I guess that's a bigger cause for celebration for you as Simon Yates winning the Vuelta. Well, it is. Um, you know, and, and, you know, she's the number one in the world. Uh, and, and, you know, to go back to back with the Giro uh, once again uh, just shows that her talent... Uh, and also the support of the team. You know, the, she's got great teammates, and uh, it's, it's fantastic to see it all come together. Your team is, you know, one of a few World Tour teams, the women's team as well. I mean, we, what, what what could be done to help develop the sport, the women's sport, a bit more? Well, I think that number one, uh, first of all, you've got to have more events. Um, be nice to see this uh, extended um, because you need competition. Uh, uh, for the opportunity for uh, the talent to come through and get the opportunity to race. Um, so that and uh, certainly the support of other teams to uh, step up uh, with the women's team. You're listening to the Cycling Podcast Feminine brought to you by Skoda. Dedicated to closing the gender gap in cycling, one race, one cyclist at a time. This is our time. Thank you very much to Skoda for their support of the Cycling Podcast Femina for the second year in a row. We're very grateful indeed to them and we'll be hearing from the Internationales in the final part. They uh, have been riding the Tour de France a day ahead of the men, a group of British women we'll be hearing a bit later on. But thank you to Skoda. Uh, now, the Giro Rosa happened at the start of the month, didn't it? Uh, I know you were glued to the, the nightly coverage, Rose. I was. I was trying to catch up with it. I have to say, at some points, because, you know, you work so late at the tour, and then you turn it on, and then you fall asleep. But then I'd watch watch it again the next day. Um, but, yeah, I was glad to have the opportunity just to watch... Uh, there was a few options to watching it, actually, this year, which is, uh, which is a first, because it's normally only been one way to watch it. And it's provided, provided some absolutely amazing racing. I mean, who can forget that... I mean, my heart absolutely bleeds for Lucy Kennedy on that stage three finish with Mariana Voss coming up behind. But I feel like that's really captured the imagination of people and really kind of spread out. And people who might not have been aware of the Giroza before will have seen that finish and thought, wow, I mean, that is some aggressive racing and some heartbreak. And then there was another, like, false celebration the very next stage, which you just think, like, oh, God. <laughs> but, um, yeah, amazing. I mean, Annemiek van Vloot on absolute prime form. I mean, we could tell that Annemiek was in absolutely uh, peak condition and had been completely targeting this race, and, and so it proved. I mean, all those, those rec- although the recon on the Gavi obviously won't have particularly helped her because it, it changed, but, um, you know, there's, uh, I mean, incredible performance uh, from her. But I was actually impressed with Kasia Niviodoma. I know she kind of slipped down uh, the rankings towards the end. She had the pink um, jersey at the beginning but um, I thought the way that Kenyon Sram rode was kind of similar to how Mitchelton Scott was riding a couple of years ago where they were kind of just learning how to be a team with a leader's jersey and how to protect it and how to ride together in order to protect that one leader so I thought even if Kasia I think has said that she might have been a bit disappointed with how it ended up I think um, she should be really proud about how she and the team um, learn through that experience and I think that that's very promising for the future I think we have to ask as well have Mitchelton Scott become the new Bowles Dolmans mm-hmm. given the way that they rode that race they finished first and third on GC with Amanda Spratt in third the way they took on the opening time trial as well it was an uphill time trial and I don't know if you saw on social after that but Grace Brown who is the Australian time trial champion but a much flatter terrain than, than they had to encounter on stage one of the Gia Rosa but she ended up with sick on her bike because she dug so deep but that just shows the level of commitment they knew they weren't going to win that <laughs> Richard's face is a picture right now uh, they knew they weren't going to win that opening time trial it went to Canyon Shram but they knew they were trying to limit their losses on that as much as possible and they delivered Anna Meek to 
just the right position when she needed to be there. To finish in third with um, Amanda Spratt as well, I think that as a team effort was just phenomenal, really strong. But Annemiek van Vluten is on a different level. She was last year too and you know what you hear from other riders is just admiration about how she dedicates herself to her sport and obviously gets the support of her team as well to take chunks of time away from racing and and, and prepare it must be quite hard being Anna van der Breggen the world champion who has been in the sort of uh, the shade a little bit of Annemiek van Vluten um, and uh, hasn't this year so far looked like the Anna van der Breggen of older, the Anna van der Breggen who won the, the world championship in that in, in the in the style that she did in Innsbruck. Yeah, she's taken a different tactic this year. I mean, she was out doing um, the Cape Epic at the beginning of the year, missing some of the classics to do that. So kind of mountain biking um, stuff. But I mean, she's I mean she's still phenomenal. I think I think it's only when. I think we got to a stage a couple of years ago when we were just every time Anna van der Breggen lined up, you were expecting just to watch her do some solo attack um, and then go off and win um, on her own all the time. And I think we're seeing her develop into a um, bit of a different rider. But I mean, there are you know, so many other riders as well. I mean, I think we get a bit um, too focused on those two riders uh, all the time when there's actually some amazing. Um, I think Soraya Paladin did, had an amazing Giro Rosa and uh, really proved that she is so talented on all sorts of trains. And, and Erica Magnaldi from WNT. Um, it was great to see some other teams coming to the fore and other new riders, new champions of the future. Yes, let's not forget Anna van der Breggen did win Flesh alone again, didn't she, this year? <laughs> uh, well, let- We're in danger of doing a Mariana Voss and Anna van der Breggen, aren't right, we? Writing her off. <laughs> uh, let's hear from two riders riding the Giro. So just before we do, I caught up with Taylor Wiles at La Course because Lizzie Banks was a peddler's de charm uh, last month at the Women's Tour. I thought since she'd kept an audio diary for us at the uh, Giro Rosa, we should present Taylor Wiles with uh, Peddler's de Charme t-shirt. So here's what she said when I gave her her t-shirt at La Course. Yeah, that was a very kind of open race. How, how was it from your point of view? Yeah, it was really fun. The course was um, up and down. There's a little bit of everything. Uh, it was a very classic style course, really similar actually to the finishing circuit at World. So that was pretty exciting. You were quite active as well. I saw you chasing quite a lot. Yeah, I was working towards the end. Um, I knew it was going to come down to a sprint and Elise is a bit quicker than me, so I was working for her. But it was, a, a, I suppose, a tailor-made finish for Marion Voss, wasn't it, in the form she's in? Yeah, unfortunately, I think everybody kind of played to that, except for Mitchelton. Like, Spratty did a really good job to get away, and Anamika attacked really hard on the second-to-last lap, but that last lap, everybody kind of just um, played into CCC, and they chased, and then there was a sprint, and Voss is just unbeatable at the moment. How do you enjoy coming in, sort of parachuting into the Tour de France like this? Is, is it? I think there was a big crowd out there today. It seemed like a great atmosphere. Is it something you enjoy? Yeah, it's a lovely atmosphere. It's always a really fun event because uh, all the fans are already here. It's great for women's cycling because they see that our racing is super exciting too. So maybe one day we'll have more than one day, but uh, I'll, I'll take what we can get. And congratulations finally on our being our peddlers to charm for the month. And thanks very much for your insights into the Giro. Oh yeah, anytime. So that was Taylor Wiles at La Course. Uh, here then are excerpts from her diary from the Giro's and also Lizzie Banks. Good morning, it's almost seven o'clock in Sheffield and I'm on my way to the train station. Um, flying from Manchester this morning to Milan. And it's three days before the start of the Giro. Um, we're all flying in today. We've got some team time trial preparation tomorrow. Uh, one rest day and then we start on Friday. So I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, there's a bit of fear and trepidation mixed in with excitement and yeah, I'm just looking forward to something new, but we'll see what happens. I'm looking forward to meeting up with my teammates today, but I'm gonna be home, away from home for a few weeks. So it's always a bit sad to leave home. Off we go. So we're on the way to our first hotel. It's still Tuesday, three days before the start. Um, I've picked up my teammate Nicola Noskover and we're the last two to arrive. So the team will be complete once we arrive. So one thing I'm really looking forward to over the next two weeks is hopefully getting some nice Italian food. <laughs> I'm not sure if that's gonna happen because race hotels are notorious for just giving us dry rice and dry chicken. But being in Italy, I'm pretty hopeful that we're gonna have some delicious pasta. And, and I think that we have a really 
really strong team this year, but a, a team that maybe might surprise people. We, um, I think out of the six of us here, only Sile has done the Giro before. And it's going to be all in over the next two weeks for, for Sile and to try and get a podium result and ultimately to try and win the race. And yeah, it's going to be a really big team effort, but I, I think that we might have surprised some people and yeah, we're going to go all in to do everything we can. So I'm just chilling in my room with Leia. Hi Leia! Hi. Um, <laughs> on the end of the final rest day, just before the jury starts tomorrow. Um, we're super excited, there's a really good atmosphere in the team. Um, I think we're all pretty scared about the TTT tomorrow with the heat in Italy. It's 35 degrees here and we're off at 3 in the afternoon. It's I know it's the same for everyone of course, but yeah, it's, it's quite a daunting prospect and you know, there's definitely extreme conditions. But um, yeah, we're all really excited. We went to the team presentation this afternoon and uh, oh, it was just a great atmosphere. Uh, you know, I've not done this race before and I think it's uh, already living up to some of the craziness that we expected in so many respects. We just found out that we beat oh Mitchelton, which means that we are definitely on the podium for the TTT. <laughs> so we're just waiting for Bowles to get in, and we know we've, we're have we in second at the moment, so we know we're definitely going to be third at least. So yeah, pretty exciting here. Hey. 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 We came second! Congratulations, team! Okay, let's get changed. So uh, we're in the car on the way to the second hotel. We've just finished the first stage of the Giro Rosa. And Elise, do you want to tell us what happened? Uh, I was drunk. No, okay, right. I'll, t I'll tell you what happened. We, we got second in the TTT. Um, we are so, so happy because, to be honest, we actually didn't really have a very good TTT. We lost our, one of our climbers who we, we didn't want to lose time with. We lost Nicola really early. And, you know, sometimes this can happen. It was really hot out there and yeah she she first ttt and yeah shit happens so yeah we lost her and we were down to five you know she was one of our four riders that was going to go to the finish and we were down to five much earlier than expected and we we had a yeah we had a mechanical in the downhill so i was leading in the downhill but um unfortunately michaela dropped her chain um and yeah so it was a bit of a nightmare in the downhill and then so yeah afterwards then we all did some pulls on the flat and then uh and then I pulled off on the last climb and uh and then even then it still really wasn't that smooth you know poor Elise was dying at the back and <laughs> and Leia sat on the front and we finished the TTT and we were all pretty upset with how it went it, it really didn't go to plan and yeah then the time started rolling in all the big teams were still to come when we finished and then yeah people kept going below us and then yeah we were we were still in second and still in second canyon came, sorry we're still in first then canyon came through they took the first spot but it was still bowls ccc um and then mitchelton yeah and then yeah each each team kept coming and then we were still in second and and then the last team bowls came through and I think they ended up in fifth maybe so yeah we we just couldn't believe it um so yeah we were pretty elated we went from being really upset and thinking you know maybe this Giro was over before it started to being like oh man <laughs> shit we've got a really good chance here and we've got a really strong team and yeah it's just so crazy so so yeah we're we're really ecstatic um Layers full of caffeine and w won't stop talking, <laughs> and and apparently that's what I'm like all the time. So I'm, and so yeah, I now feel sorry for everybody I've ever met. Um, but we're on the way to our hotel. We've got a three-hour transfer today. We're going up to near Turin. Um, we're staying in a little agroturismo farm house uh, up the mountainside. Um, so yeah, it should be pretty pretty nice. Um, it should be a bit cooler up there too. 
um, and then we start in a town called View, which I'm sure I've just completely mangled. We start there and finish there tomorrow, doing a nice circular route. So yeah, we're really looking forward to it. Um, not going to get too much rest tonight because we're probably not going to get back to the hotel until almost eight o'clock, and then yeah, dinner meeting. Yeah, Leia. I'm I'm rooming with Leia, so the chance of me getting any sleep is pretty slim. Um, but hopefully, <laughs> hopefully she'll come down off her coffee and high at some point in the next five hours. But yeah, we'll see. I, I've got some pretty pretty solid earplugs. So, okay, speak to you tomorrow, guys. Stage one. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was not our best stage, I have to say. We had some struggles in the form of mechanicals. <laughs> so, kind of a bummer because I think we could have had a really good ride because we were all riding really strong and really good as a unit, but sometimes in bike racing, stuff happens. But we have nine more days and. We got to watch the mountain bike short track on the way home in the transfer and watch our teammate Yolanda kick some ass. So that was a bonus of the day. And even though we're kind of bummed out, we are trying to stay positive because we have nine more days, which is nine more chances. And it's a super hard Giro. So yeah, you never know what can happen. We lost a minute today, but we could gain a minute tomorrow. Just gotta stay positive. Stage two. This was the first road race stage. And it started on a 15 kilometer climb, um, which wasn't ridden very hard. It was kind of pretty mellow. No real big attacks or anything. Um, got a little faster over the top because there was a pretty technical descent. So all the good descenders wanted to go down in the front and we all made it down and then we were in this valley for a while it was pretty boring in the valley but there were some attacks and little breakaways and then we came to the final climb which was this 10-ish k i think but it was more of like a kind of a gradual climb along the river it's really beautiful not that we noticed uh but we had a tailwind so it was really really fast yeah, teams were just keeping it keeping it fast. There were some attacks, but everything just kept getting stitched back together. And then even though I was full gas, I attacked with a K to go, which not 100% that was the smartest move, but I guess, yeah, gave it a go. And then quickly got caught and swallowed up by an extremely fast charging field. And then Eliza and Ruth sprinted in the finish and Mariana Voss sprint was pretty freaking fantastic. If you haven't watched the replay, you should watch it because she looks like somebody shot her out of a cannon. The cycling podcast Femina is supported by Science in Sport. Science in Sport, fueled by science. Thank you to Science in Sport for their support of the cycling podcast. You can get 25% off all your Science in Sport sports nutrition products at scienceandsport.com with the code SISCP25 SISCP25 CP25 CP25 SISCP25 Whoa! We've actually had a few little, I don't want to say complaints, but people saying that's a real earworm and that's been just rolling around in their head all day. So. I can't listen to Lionel saying it without singing it in my head now, so yeah, it's got it's gone into my ear too. Well, he was trying Souls. to do... S-I-S-C-B-25. <laughs> but then he got dropped, didn't it, quite early on? Which I yeah, never, never caught on that. <laughs> um, well, listen, uh, a group of, well, quite a, lot, quite a few groups of women have been riding the men's Tour de France, route of the men's Tour de France, a day ahead of the men, and we heard from them in the last episode. Let's, uh, let's catch up with them again, um, having completed the course. Well, Helen, you're, you're back at work, having ridden the, the entire route of the Tour de France. I mean, I don't know how you sum that up in a few minutes, but... How do you feel? Yeah, it's all a bit surreal, to be honest. It half feels like I've landed back from another planet um, and half feels like everything is back to normal and, and nothing's really changed. But um, the whole experience has just been a- 
absolutely incredible. Um, you know, meeting meeting the team for the first time and then riding together um, for those three and a half weeks has just been, yeah, just a, an experience that I'll never forget. We've become so, so close. And actually, that's almost one of the strangest things now um, that we've suddenly got time on our own and that we're not all together as, as a team. So it almost feels quite, quite lonely and... Um, you know, all the in-jokes that happen on tour. Uh, <laughs> most should stay on tour for sure. Mm-hmm. But, um, yeah, kind of no one else really gets gets what we've kind of been through. Um, so that's quite a strange adjustment to, to start to try and make. So did, did it meet or, you know, live up to expectations or was it just something you couldn't have imagined? <sighs> yeah, it's difficult because I think... To be honest, in the in the run up to it, everything just seemed to happen so quickly, um, and I kind of it's one of those things where you know every event or challenge that you enter, you always think you've got loads of time to prepare and to train, and and then you know suddenly that that time just ticks away. Um, and I only found out that I was joining the team with about a hundred days to go. Um, and so that time just seemed to, you know, completely whiz by. And there wasn't really, it sounds weird, but there wasn't really that much chance to get nervous or think about what it was going to be like. It was all just sort of loads and loads of to-do lists of things that I wanted to get sorted. Um, but having now done it and reflecting back, I mean, A, it's just a massive physical effort that we've just been through. Um, so we ended up doing kind of over 3,400k and about 52,000 metres of climbing which is just insane and we sort of say it and roll it off like it's you know a normal thing but actually just a ridiculous physical effort Um, and then mentally I don't think we could have really prepared for what we were going to go through but we had to just sort of take it one day at a time really. Were there any tough moments what what was the what was the hardest moment for you? Um, yeah, there was definitely tough moments on a on a daily basis. I think um, I think one thing that everyone, me included, found really hard was the amount of sleep or the the not amount of sleep that we were getting. Um, so we were often sort of maximum six hours in bed, which um, you know, for a couple of hours, if you're trying to wind down and get your body to relax, you know, you're already in kind of such a deficit in terms of in terms of your sleep um, and the impact that has on you when you're then, you know, feeling pretty rubbish on the bike and not much energy. You feel very emotional. There were lots of uh, tears <laughs> from the rest of the team. Um, you know, lots of laughs as well, for sure. And but just huge emotions. Um, I think some of the challenging times on the bike was just, I mean, some of the climbs, um, you know, the elevation, the steepness of some of the climbs, so stage six, the plonge de Belfi, Mm. you know, no one's ever done anything like that. Um, And it gets kind of to be this big thing in your head that you automatically assume that you can't do. And then each day we were just achieving stuff that we never thought was even possible um so those kind of emotional roller coasters definitely existed each day i think we all expected it to be tough i don't think we necessarily expected to have um as much fun as we did when we were away the team just really gelled together really nicely and um yeah we had a lot of stupid jokes and um just taking our mind off things um which was which was amazing i think for the team as a highlight probably stage 20 um so that's when we'd done our last mountain stage that was one of the stages that um was cut short for the professional men um so we'd got to the top of Falteren. it was pissing with rain and we regrouped about 500 meters from the end or from what we thought the end was um and we just really really wanted to cross the line together as a team um, and we sort of waited and were trying to hide under bridges. Some of the girls didn't have their jackets because the van had been moved on by um, by the police. And we just really kind of wanted to kind of stay together and, and cross the line as, as a team. And when we did that, it was just incredible. Like that was our big celebration. That was our last day in the mountains. And we all just kind of had a massive group hug. And it was really emotional, actually, at the end of that day. Well, that was Helen Sharp of the Internationals telling us all about her 
um, well, what sounds like an incredible experience riding the route of the Tour de France, doing the whole route as well, unlike unlike the men. Um, impressive. Oh, yeah. And it's, I mean, when we think, when I think about what the weather was like on that Friday, not far away, that they were finishing the, the next Ooh. day's stage at that time. I mean, they were obviously lucky, but it wasn't very nice. And, you know, they went through all 40 degrees down in the south to cold and hailstones and so on in the Alps. So well done to them. And it sounds like an incredible experience that that they had and uh well done to skoda as well for supporting them and perhaps making a difference in terms of uh the sort of campaign with aso to put on a women's race uh, as we discussed earlier finally just before we go a reminder that we're doing a few live events in the autumn the first one is at the world championships in yorkshire in harrogate at the royal hall on friday september the 27th uh, that's set to be the biggest event we've ever done as a cycling podcast. Then in November, we're doing a grand tour. Uh, Bristol, St. George's Hall on Monday the 11th of November. Cardiff, St. David's Hall on Tuesday the 12th of November. Worcester, Huntingdon Hall on Wednesday the 13th of November. The Belfast MAC on the 15th of November, that's a Friday. Um, the Arts Theatre in London on the 18th and the 25th of November, the Leicester Y Theatre on Thursday, the 28th of November, and at the Manchester RNCM on Saturday, the 30th of November. One or two more uh, events to be announced, but you can get tickets to all of those, and I think you can imagine that Orla Shinnewi will be at at least one of them, the one in Belfast, close to her home, of course, on Friday the 15th of November. Uh, tickets to all of these events can be purchased at thecyclingpodcast.com. Just go to live events on the left hand side of the page, click on live events, and it'll take you to our live events page. Anyway, um, that's it for this month. What we've got to look forward to next, Rose? Oh, there's, well, there's the Women's Tour of Scotland, brand new race. There's the Vorgorda races, they're always good. There's the Ladies' Tour of Norway. Oh, there's, there's just loads, isn't there? European champs as Rumpy, well. De Plue. Oh, yeah. Balls Ladies Tour, Madrid. We'll be in Madrid, won't we? We will. Some yeah, maybe we'll record a bit of the next cycling podcast, Femina, from there. I can't really... Re- it's only early August. That'll be early September, I suppose. We might... I don't know. We'll, yeah, we'll, we'll cobble something together. Um, we'll certainly be back before the World <laughs> Championships, and we're going to have additional episodes over the World Championships as well. Uh, so look out for that um but that's all for this month thank you very much rose thanks richard thanks orla thanks orla thank you you're listening to the cycling podcast feminine brought to you by skoda dedicated to closing the gender gap in cycling one race one cyclist at a time this is our time